we continue with the second session, we have Paula Belzig from Copenhagen. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you. Um, speak closer. Yes. <clears throat> yes, hi. Uh, I'm going to tell you about fault tolerant entanglement assisted communication. This is a joint work with Matthias Christandl in Copenhagen and uh, Alexander Müller Hermes in Oslo. Um, so, first, we're going to talk about the setup for entanglement assisted communication and fault tolerant communication, and then I'm going to give a high level overview over how we prove a coding theorem for the situation. So, when I talk about communication, what I mean is that there is some sender. Now here, that's person who, who lives at E, and some receiver who lives at D, and they are connected by some communication line. So this could be a wire with some certain error model that happens during the transmission of data. Now this is just a classical setup, so now I'm just encoding a bit string and want to transmit this bit string to the receiver and some noise corrupts the symbols along the way according to some conditional probability distribution and now we want to find out how well we can communicate this information. So um, naively if you have a channel that just flips a bit um, it, this will be very bad if you want to just transmit a bit zero or one and it flips it along the way you will not have a great success I mean, you, if it flips with probability p you will have a probability P that your outcome bit is corrupted. So if you wanted to communicate like your password or some sort of uh, secret information or not secret information, this is problematic. So what you can do in the classical scenario is you just send your information many times and most of the time it will arrive correct. So that's why we uh, have in this picture N copies of this channel T that corrupts your bit along the way. So now I'm I want to send maybe zero and I send it n times, then it will arrive correct, hopefully most of the time, if p is small. And then the decoder person, the receiver, can do a majority vote to figure out what I wanted to send. And that way you can get great success probability of transmitting your information. But on the other hand, what you are doing now is using your uh, channel or your wire very many times. So you just keep sending the zero, which is also not great for communicating your password. So um, there is some trade-off between the number of times you have to use the channel and, uh, and the success probability. And the question is, can we communicate such that the success probability of communicating does approach one in the limit of infinitely many uh, transmissions? And your rate of message bit per channel use is not zero. And this is called, uh, and then if you can find a non-zero rate, this is a transition rate for a specific encoding and decoding scheme. Um, and the best possible transmission rate is the wire's capacity. And uh, in principle, this is an optimization problem over encoders and decoders. But it turns out, as Shannon found out in the 1940s, um, that there's actually a really nice uh, entropic quantity the mutual information that characterizes this. So instead of having a complicated optimization problem, you have an, uh, smaller, uh, uh, an easier optimization problem that uh, tells you uh, that the way that your wire transmits information is really just mainly depending on the probability distributions associated to uh, the message you're preparing and the, how the wire corrupts your message. So this is nice. Um, and this can be asked more generally also for quantum situations. So you could have a wire that has quantum properties um, and you want to communicate between maybe two di distant parts of a quantum chip or two quantum chips. Um, then you, you have a little bit of a different situation, but you can still ask if you can find a good encoder and a good decoder such that uh, your success probability of transmitting a message still approaches one and you still have a non-zero rate. So there's different uh, quantum generalizations you can think of, and here we're going to talk about uh, quantum uh, entanglement-assisted communication. So in this case, we also consider that the encoder and the decoder um, have access to entanglement. You can also not do that, but uh, there's different uh, scenarios that all leverage sort of different quantum effects leading to different achievable rates and capacities. And in this case, this would be called the entanglement-assisted capacity of this uh, quantum channel, 
And uh, it turns out that that is also equal to some mutual information, which is uh, basically the quantum analog of the classical case. If you don't have entanglement between the sender and the receiver, you do not get this rate. So somehow there is something about uh, the entanglement assistance that makes it uh, possible to find an analog of the classical case. Yes, so this all is sort of solved. Um, a long time ago maybe. Um, it's a nice uh, thing that you can cal calculate and if, especially uh, if two wire models have the same uh, entanglement assisted capacity, you can simulate them with each other. There's some nice uh, way that this uh, quantity characterizes your channel. But um, here, if you wanted to actually now uh, do a communication scenario with your quantum computer or parts of your quantum computer, the first thing you would do is program the best encoder and decoder that you just that you would find in your maybe optimization problem, um, and this would be made up out of quantum gates in a gate-based computation model. And these gates they are not free of faults, so even if you have the best map from your classical message to your uh, quantum state that you prepare to send through the channel, um, this doesn't mean that it will actually prepare the state exactly. And depending on your error model, it could be quite devastating uh, what it prepares here. So uh, in, for this scenario, this is basically an, an assumption that uh, further uh, looks at the quantum nature of these encoding and decoding maps. Uh, for this scenario, we define a capacity that we call the entanglement-assisted fault-tolerant capacity. So we still consider uh, assistance by entanglement, uh, but we think of these maps as um, as actual objects we want to build and implement, and they have an error model associated. So um, how would you deal with errors in quantum gates? So the first step, of course, is to think of this as a set, uh, not a set, a sequence of gates from some, some gate set. And then uh, in our case here, we are assuming a Pauli IID error model, where uh, each gate has a probability to be affected by a Pauli error with probability p. It's one of the simplest error models, maybe not the most accurate, but more, for the moment, it's also more of a proof of principle that we, that we can still find a rate in the, in the uh, presence of noise. So this is the error model that we will be looking at here. And uh, luckily, people in fault tolerance have already done a lot of work on, on this kind of uh, problem, where you uh, can use the techniques from, from quantum error correcting codes and fault tolerant computing to implement these uh, circuits here. So um, you can use more qubits to uh, protectively simulate your, your state that you want to prepare here. Um, and then uh, you can basically um, get to a better, uh, or you can uh, significantly reduce the probability of error happening in these, uh, in these circuits. So uh, here we're going to use the seven qubit Steen code. You can choose other error correcting codes perhaps, but the seven qubit Steen code has a special, uh, especially good uh, structure. So we're going to concatenate the seven qubit Steen code, which encodes one qubit and seven qubits at each level. And if every gate, every physical gate that we perform is uh, affected with an error P, with a Pauli error, then we can. Uh, we can implement this in the seven qubit Steen code and the simulated circuit has a error scaling that scales with the level. So that uh, is helpful, but uh, does that solve the problem? Um, not exactly, because now, naively, if you, okay, so, I mean, if you naively just look at your entire um, coding scenario, so um, you just treat this as a whole really big circuit, if you, um, if you use this encoding, suddenly every uh, physical qubit is represented by seven to the L, uh, every logical qubit is represented by seven to the L physical qubits. So in the naivest way possible, this would mean that your capacity, that you're transmitting M message bits, but now you're using N times seven to the L qubits, uh, qubit channels to do that. So this is not a great rate, and in particular, if your gate error is really, really small, this doesn't, this is a, an overkill. And also, if you are considering this kind of setup, then your channels for which you can get some capacity, they will all be uh, 
channels that have to be quite close to identity because they also would have to be locations below the threshold. So um, the, this doesn't really work or it gives you a really bad capacity that goes to zero. And um, now what we did is that we um, used a different strategy uh, by which we can see that, the, by which we can uh, get that the capacity, the fault tolerant version of the capacity uh, is lower bounded by the normal faultless version of the entanglement assisted capacity reduced by some small uh, function of the gate error and this function goes to zero as p goes to zero. And this is for all channels, not just channels that are close to identity. Um, and now I'm gonna just outline how we achieve this. Um, so our strategy has uh, two key players, which are this, uh, these triangles here, which we call the encoding and decoding interface. So what we are doing, in essence, is from this circuit here, which is now uh, simulated by seven to the L qubits for each logical qubit, um, we go back to the single qubit um, by some extra small circuit that we perform here. So then what, we, what uh, this does is that there's only n copies of T still used and, your, um, and it doesn't uh, hurt your rate with seven to the L that you're encoding this in, seven to, in the concatenated seven qubits decode. And um, yes, and the, the problem with this is that while you're decoding the, the um, computation is not protected anymore in the same way from the fault tolerant code. So in, in the usual fault tolerance scenarios, people usually uh, look at codes where uh, you're mapping from classical information to other classical information and then you can effectively uh, get the whole computation uh, will, be, will be getting a really good error probability, but here you're leaving the code space along the way and somehow there's always one last annoying gate that you perform on, on this communication line. So there is still for sure something of the order P uh, that, that will affect your channel here. So well, how do we uh, deal with that? We, um, we can prove for these uh, triangles here a, the uh, a, a effective uh, channel theorem where we can see them as an effective channel that acts with some probability uh, that is one minus some constant times p uh, identity. So for with, with this probability, uh, everything is fine and, uh, uh, and it acts exactly as it should and you can have the normal encoder here. And um, with some probability constant time p, times p, you get really, really bad and horrible noise. So this is kind of the best we can hope for because I just said that each of these, like the last gate maybe will happen with probability will have with probability p some error, so you will have an effective channel that probably has some probability p in here. And um, this is kind of uh, a, maybe a good thing we can hope for. And it turns out that for these interfaces, for the seven qubit Steen code, we can prove such a theorem. And um, because this is more of an effect, before, because this is an effective situation and in reality, when we're doing fault tolerant uh, strategies, there is some uh, input here where, the, where there could be a last uh, C naught in the code that is performed like right here. That would mean that these uh, interfaces, the, uh, decoding interfaces get correlated input. There's some, uh, in our effective scenario, there's also some correlations and we prove that you can basically view this at a small error as uh, a state that is input into your effective channel where you have the perfect uh, noiseless encoder preparation of the state and some really horribly correlated uh, noise across all the communication lines. So um, in our scenario for uh, fault tolerant entanglement assisted communication, um, there's two parts of, to this where this effective interface uh, plays a role. One part is the entanglement uh, assistance part. So uh, to compare to the usual model of entanglement assisted uh, communication, we have uh, a lot of copies of the maximally entangled state available where one of the qubits is available to the sender and one is available to the receiver. And uh, if we're trying to use this entanglement in our encoding and decoding procedure, it has to be also in the code space. So uh, we use an encoding interface 
to get it from the physic, uh, from the, well, yeah, from the single qubit uh, space to the code space, and that also introduces some noise. So for the, okay, for the encoding interface, of course, there's a similar, like, effective uh, constant times p noise situation, and so this entangled state, when it is transmitted into, or uh, introduced into the code space, it will effectively be a mixed state with some noise. And um, then to use uh, a coding scheme that we want to use, we will uh, we use a small part of this circuit here to perform entanglement distillation to get back to uh, pure and beautiful maximally entangled states in the code space, because we need the entanglement to be available in the code space in order to use it for the uh, for the communication. And the other side is that we uh, can have, uh, so this triangle fails with some probability constant times p, and this triangle fails with some probability constant times p. So we can see this sort of as, a, as an effective uh, channel acting here, but this channel, because of this correlation situation, has a lot of correlated input, highly correlated input across all of these communication lines. So this is not quite covered by usual uh, coding theory. There's some uh, work on uh, perturbations and uh, maybe jam jammer channels where people uh, think of a channel where someone is jamming some input in. But this doesn't uh, quite apply here because also the, uh, the, the amount of correlation grows with n. So uh, for this we had to uh, use a extra uh, approximation where we uh, kind of control the correlation in this super bad noise. Um, with some, uh, with some payment uh, so that we get an effective channel without this correlation. And this again has to do with the probability of the noise and then um, you get some extra super bad channel that, uh, that you don't want to use. But uh, in the end, we do obtain a result where the fault tolerant entanglement distance capacity is uh, lower bounded by an achievable rate, which is given by the noiseless version minus some function of p. And this function of p, so what we are doing in the end is we are constructing a coding scheme where we um, are coding for the effective channel rather than the original channel. And this uh, coding for, oops, sorry, this coding for tf uh, costs us a little bit. And then we have to use continuity for the uh, for the relation between the original uh, channel T that we want to code for and this uh, effective channel. So this also costs us a little bit. Then we pay a little bit of price for this noise and we pay a little bit of a price for the entanglement distillation. So that is where, um, that is this F of P is made out of these contributions and um, is of the order P log P. So when we send the probability P, which is the single gate error um, to zero, this f of p also goes to zero. So we recover that you can uh, communicate in the noiseless case at the noiseless entanglement distance capacity. And this works for any channel t. This function also depends on the dimension of t, not on t itself. So what we can recover basically is that you can still communicate in the presence of such noise with this strategy at a rate that's almost the same. So this is a, an achievable rate for, the, for fault tolerant communication and it's not uh, as bad as it would seem at first glance, let's say. So, um, of course, we uh, were doing here uh, with a, uh, so our, our results here, they are focused on a specific code where we're using this concatenation structure of the seven qubit Steen code and also a specific error model, this Pauli IID noise. Um, so it's more of a proof of principle that in some noise uh, scenario with some code you can uh, construct such a coding scheme and so communicate at some good rate. And um, in, in uh, an ideal world, we would also like to extend this to more codes and more noise. So actually, um, the, the IID Pauli noise probably can be replaced by other IID noise, but um, I don't, or we at the moment uh, have an open, it is an open question what we would do in the case of correlated noise, so this is not covered by this and um, there's some more work to do for more specific codes. The seven qubit Steen code is also not the best code uh, we can think of. Um, it's just 
a very nice code because of this concatenation structure, which uh, controls the error when you're doing this uh, actual decoding out of the code space. But um, yes, so it's uh, also an open question for other codes. But thank you. Thank you very much, Paula, for the beautiful talk. Congratulations on the result. It's very interesting. We have time for a few questions. Oh. Thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a question. So in your protocol, you have the encoder and decoder, and you've got to uh, jump through hoops in order to understand you know, the super bad noise. Uh, would, it, uh, would it help if you had a code with a constant rate, for instance, if you were to use uh, good LDPC codes? Uh, would uh, would your proof um, kind of apply? Do you envision doing it in that setting? Um, yes, I mean, uh, we don't have a formal proof for this, and um, I have not spent much time with LDPC codes, but to my understanding, it also uses a concatenation structure to prepare the ancillas. And in that um, sense, maybe we could use similar techniques there. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean the the overhead of this code is really is pretty bad. Actually, I think the best uh, the, the a really good candidate for a code where it would also work is this code uh, that by <coughs> Yamasaki Sun and the other where they also use concatenation but with increasing distance. But um, for LDPC codes, I think there's also hope uh, in the sense that there's also a concatenation uh, structure used there. But I'm not an expert. Any other question? Um, so can I ask you about this super bad noise? <laughs> yes. So what is, are you assuming, are you proving? So mm -hmm. these are IID, let's say, Pauli noises. Yes. Right? And at some point, you use some, some, some kind of equivalence with this correlated noise. Is that, yes. are you assuming that? Are you showing that? Sorry, that's the um, one part that I didn't get. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, we can we can definitely show this with some um, with some syndrome state that depends on all the on the all the errors that happened during mm -hmm. all of the circuit mm -hmm. and the structure of the state uh, we make no assumption on that right. so we are looking at sort of a worst case uh, mm -hmm. correlation syndrome mm -hmm. scenario um, actually it could be that for IID poly noise you can say more about the state mm -hmm. and um, about this effective channel then. Yeah, but um, we couldn't. Uh, but then, but then, how how you how do you deal with this type of noise? How do you correct it? Like, can you also correct it? With, this cannot be corrected with the STN no. the seven qubit code, right? No, you really use this sort of a post selection uh, type technique, mm -hmm. where you uh, right. separate the not so correlated uh, or the not correlated uh, effective channels and the correlated effective channels. I see. Okay. But. Uh, so you use post-selection there? Yes, right. yes. And you pay a price for that? Yes. But it's still polynomial. Okay. Exactly, right. yeah. So that's okay. also why the error will not go completely right. to okay. zero. Thank you. F of okay, two. thanks. Um, any other questions? Yeah, the first thing. Thanks for the very nice talk. The, do you know this artificial term that you have capacity minus F of P? Um, I wonder if that term is kind of artifact of your proof strategy. And you also mentioned that it depends on the dimension of the channel, right? Yes. Sorry, what was the question? It's an artifact of the proof strategy. Yes. It can be improved still? Yes. It can probably also be improved. I mean, um, it is definitely an artifact of, uh, of this construction of these interfaces because, uh, I mean, that, that is what we're using to construct this effective channel. Right. And um, probably there could, I mean, or to our knowledge, there could be, there, there, we don't know any other strategy for proving that the rate does not vanish. And, um, and we, I mean, ideally we would like to have some uh, capacity that will um, not be zero all the time and also uh, approach the normal fault test version. So these things are fulfilled here, but you could probably improve um, this F of P. I mean, it's, it's more, it's in that sense also more of a proof of principle bound. It's not a, great function. I mean, it's order P log P, but the dimension is in there somewhere, and um, probably there could be uh, tighter uh, yeah. steps here. 
So, yeah. All right. Thanks very much. Um, any other question? Um, all right. If not, we thank Paula once again. Thank you very much.